Years ago in the Netherlands, there were preachers who were forbidden by the state church of that time, which is still in existence today in the Netherlands. They were forbidden to preach, but they were allowed to pray. And that's how we got the long congregational prayers. They were essentially sermons. Then the state church decided they may not pray. And that's when they came to America and settled in these parts. So history has a way of repeating itself in different ways. So I'm going to use some verses from the book of Naaman as we pray. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we think of Assyria as at that time the most powerful nation on earth, and we think of these United States. We confess that it's so easy to be proud of our self-sufficiency and military might, how it is easy to plunder, to oppress, to slaughter. We think of how a hundred years earlier, before the book of Naaman, that thy servant Jonah preached in the streets of that capital city, Nineveh. And we think of Nineveh today and the difficulties with the wars we're having in that part of the world. We thank thee that thou didst turn their hearts from their evil. But even a few generations later, that evil was again reigning. And that thou didst send Naaman to pronounce that judgment. And so as we think of how Nineveh as a city of blood, a city of cruelty, a city of arrogance and idolatry and murder, lies, treachery and injustice, and how Naaman predicted that that proud and powerful nation will be destroyed, and how the end came within 50 years. O oh God, today as we hear thy servant, that we may be reminded that just as thou didst judge the city of Nineveh for idolatry and arrogance and oppression, that thou art able to do the same for these United States and any nation of the world, that the rise and fall of the nations is determined by thee, Give us confidence that no matter what happens, that we may remember that thou dost rule over all the earth, even over those who don't acknowledge thee, that thou art all-powerful, and that no one can thwart thy plans. We thank thee that thou wilt overcome any who attempt to defy thee, so that we may see, as others have in the past, even in the history of this country, that all our human power put together is but a drop in the bucket dust on the scales is futile against thee. So bless the speaker today, so that we may sense that thou art God, and that our confidence is in thee. For thou alone dost rule all of history, his story, thy story. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is my privilege to be able to introduce Kevin Freeman, and I'd like to introduce him this way. Uh, first, how many of you are familiar with Frank Gaffney? Okay, many of you then have, have been to our conferences. Well, back in 2012, Jan and I went to the Value Voters Summit in Washington, D.C., and uh, when we were there, we heard about this Frank Gaffney, and we'd heard about some of the issues that he dealt with in relationship to Muslim Brotherhood and Islam and so on. So we went to a breakout session, that room was packed. We learned all kinds of information that just um, really in many ways, uh, I would say, in a, in a positive way, just made us, helped us to understand the times in, in order to know what to do. And as a result of that, we, we have brought Frank Gaffney and other speakers in to educate and inform throughout our, uh, throughout our state particularly. Uh, and uh, the, uh, many eyes have been opened as, as ours were and are continued to be opened. And I would just want to, I'm s stating that to say Kevin Freeman is such an individual as well. He's a mighty tool of the Lord and he has information that will be new to, to many of you. New and helpful and vitally important. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, including this morning. Saturday morning to come and hear me. You all are dedicated. Thank you. I, I'm going to share with you just a, a little bit about my background. 
I started my career as an investment manager. My father is a stockbroker. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I began managing money uh, for clients starting when I graduated from college in 1983. And in 1987, I had the privilege to interview the man I thought was the greatest stock market investor in the world. His name was Sir John Templeton. And I uh, met him in 1987 because in August of 1987, I wrote my first newsletter titled The Personal Capitalist, and I had an interview with him. And I was very fortunate that the interview set up this way. I contacted his, the guy that ran his mutual funds and marketing and said, might, might we have a phone call? And he said yes to a phone call, and then he forgot to take the call. He was gone to an appointment or something. And, and he said, I never miss appointments. I'm very sorry. I apologize. I owe you a favor. Now, I'm just you know a couple of years out of college, and I'm a very young man. And he's a very successful mutual fund man. And I, he said, what would you like? And I said, I want to interview Sir John Marks Templeton. Uh, Sir John was just knighted by the Queen. He was a billionaire. He lived in Lyford Key in the Bahamas. And he was the most famous investor in the world. If you remember Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, Louis Rukeyser had John Templeton on, and he looked up to him. So I wanted to, and, and, and so the man I was talking to said, Hey, I owe you a favor. I would have said no to you. We don't do interviews like that. I would have said no to you. You've got a publication with maybe three or 400 subscribers to it. There's no way I would allow you to interview John Templeton. But I missed your call. I owe you a favor. And that's what you asked, so I'll arrange it. And it had to be arranged by fax. I'd write the questions on fax and fax it to him. He'd answer back and he wrote on the pages, fax pages, and faxed it back to me. And, I, and we went back and forth. And I asked him a question because the stock market had been pretty good. I came out of uh, college in 83. And if you remember, President Reagan uh, became president in 1980. He won the election. He started his office in 81. He was shot later in 1981. The stock market was in tumult. The interest rates were double digit. Inflation was miserable. Paul Volcker was deciding he's going to bring the economy down. And the stock market was in August of 1982. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was 770. You know, now it's over 25,000, right? But then it was 770 in August 1982. And it had been 770 from as high as, as, as 16 years earlier. It had been 1,000 on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, so it had gone from 1,000 to 772 in 16 years, which is a pretty miserable stock market, wouldn't you say? You, you hold on to it 16 years and you lose 23%. That's not good, right? And the market under President Reagan, they were going to change the policies, everything began to change, and the stock market started to creep up, and it went from 770 in August 1982 to 2,700 in August 1987. And that's when I was able to interview Sir John. So in five years, it went from 770 to 2700. Now, just as an aside, 10 years ago, about this time, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was, well, in March of 2009, it was 6,500. And it was, just a month or so ago, 26,500. So we've seen kind of a similar run-up, right? And the reason I tell you that is when I interviewed John Templeton, I asked him, what's next in the stock market? What's going to happen next? And the answer he gave me was, in 47 years of studying the stock market, I have never been able to find a single person or organization that can tell me what's happening next in the market. Just can't figure it out. But here's wisdom I'll share. Every bull market, rising stock market, is followed by a bear market. And every bear market is followed by a bull market. So if you're in a bull market, you should be looking for the next bear market. And if you're in a bear market, you should be looking for the next bull market. So, oh, that's great wisdom. So I write back, what would a bear market look like, Sir John? And you know, send it off on the facts, and it goes and it comes back. 
And here was his answer. Well, a bear market, you could lose 40% of your money and it could happen in as little as two months or it could take as long as two years. Okay, so the Dow's 2,700. I did quick math in my head, rounding. I said, okay, so the Dow could drop from 2,700 to 1,700 and you say it could happen by October? Because that was two months, September, October from August. And he wrote back, why yes, it could. In October 1987, we had the October 87 crash and the Dow went from 2,700 to 1,700. And I'll tell you, I just happened to serendipitously ask him at that moment in time what was going to happen and his marketing people went nuts. He never claimed he could predict the market and he wasn't predicting it then. He just happened to say it could be 1700 and the marketing people said, let's get this out in print and tell every stockbroker and every client everywhere that John Templeton said this could have happened and that way it'll you know, help shore up confidence. And so they published, they called and asked for permission to publish. And I said, I'll give you permission on one condition. They said, you want us to write your check? And I said, no, I would like to have the opportunity to meet Sir John in person. And they said yes. And on December 2nd, 1987, I and about 45 of my closest friends went to meet John Templeton. And the reason is, is because I said, hey, um, I'm get, I get to meet John Templeton. And people said, I want to meet him. And I said, Oh, let's have a conference, and your conference fee is $400, and we will all go together and meet John Templeton, and we arranged a trip, and I became a little entrepreneur and made a little bit of money, met John Templeton. He liked me enough that, that a few years later, um, I gave him an award called the Adam Smith Award for Individual Excellence and Free Enterprise. He came to Tulsa, and, and he liked me enough that he hired me. I went to work for him, and I built a private client group with with friends, we built a, a two and a half billion dollar division of Templeton organization. And it's just it's launched my career. And, and I share all of that because people keep asking me what's gonna happen in the stock market today. And the wisdom he gave me in 1987 applies just as much today as it did then. But I wanna tell you some things have changed since 1987. Have you noticed that? The world is a little different. So I have a venture now, it's called the Economic War Room. And the reason we call it the Economic War Room is because people still, as they were then, are interested in what's gonna happen with my money. How many people here have investments? Are you concerned? You notice the last week, you're concerned? People wanna know what's gonna happen with their money. I want to tell you that this goes beyond money, and it goes beyond money in a big way. We're in a war. We call it the war room because we're in a war, and that's a fact. But it's not really an economic war. We use the term economic war because that grabs people's attention. What we're really in is a spiritual war. And because you're in this room, you know that. You don't come out to hear something Bill Johnson's arranged, or you don't come to this church without knowing that we're in a spiritual war. And things have changed since 1987 rather dramatically. And the reality of it is, is that the war, we look like we're losing. You have these traditional family values and you want to see them exercised in the country and you see that actually there's a rise of all sorts of things that you never expected. I mean, for example, whoever thought that they'd be legalizing marijuana everywhere they can? Who'd have thought that? And they're putting it in brownies, and people are dying, by the way. They're dying because they get this, they don't understand it, they take this, and, and they think they can fly. And I've had friends who've lost loved ones because of things like that. Who, who'd ever thought that marriage would be redefined as it is? Or who'd ever thought that there'd be an argument over whether someone born a male <clears throat> with X and Y chromosomes could go and enter a woman's cycling race and win the gold medal and everybody applaud that. Or that they tell you in California that if you serve someone a plastic straw, you can go to jail. Or in New York, they worry about the soda size. If uh, selling you a 32 ounce soda, it's illegal to do that. You have to sell it. 
Who'd ever thought these would be the conversations of America? In 1987, we were fighting the Cold War, which we won. But now we have candidates who are standing up and saying, I'm a socialist, vote for me. How in the world has our country gotten to where it is? It's because we're in a war. And it's a spiritual war. Now I'll grant you, really the war has these dimensions. People say, how has life changed? Life is changed by politics. And you say, what do you mean? I said, it's politics that's driving it. It's the Supreme Court ruled and says that you can have marriage between two of the same sex. It's the Supreme Court that's made decisions. These are political things, all of them. Abortion is a political issue. It's not solely a political issue, but it's a political issue. You go and vote on this candidate's pro-life, this candidate's pro-choice. And we're in the midst of an election season in which people are making these decisions. Well, how did we get there? Well, what determines politics? It's really education and culture. I heard culture eats politics for breakfast. If the culture is going one way, you get your candidates in, they're going to be swept out, and the culture is going to override the politics over time. And what overrides culture? Entertainment. So if you want to change the culture in America, I remember when Ellen DeGeneres had her own show called The Ellen Show. Not the current Ellen Show, but it's a comedy, a situation comedy, Ellen, and there were rumors you'd pick up the USA Today and it'd say, you know, Ellen may come out. I said, what does come out mean? Well, Ellen is going to admit that she is the L word. What's the L word? And she went on and she would go on a talk show. She said, yes, I admit I'm the L word. I'm Lebanese. And she joked about it and joked about it. And then finally she came out and, and groups like the American Decency Association and others said, well, we need to have her off television. And her show was canceled and off television. But she came back because it started showing up in movies and air, you couldn't turn on a, a television show without seeing a promotion of homosexuality, whether it was will and grace. Entertainment controls culture. Do you see what I'm saying? Now we have Tim Allen had a, had a comedy that was actually quite popular and they canceled it. Last Man Standing. But I think they canceled it because they didn't want him putting that entertainment out because they know entertainment controls culture. What controls entertainment? There's one answer. Spirit. Money absolutely is truth in that, but it's actually spiritual. What do you entertain as an individual and what does society entertain as a society? That determines, that determines all of this. If we're entertaining the thoughts, if you set your mind on the things above, the Bible says, you're going to enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. The, the mindset on spiritual things is life and peace. The mindset on fleshly things, that's death. And this is very clear from Romans. It's where we set our mind. It's because we're three-part human beings. We're a spirit, soul, and a body. We're a spirit being made in the image of God, the Imago Dei. We possess a soul. Our soul is made up of our mind and our will and our emotions. The word spirit is based on pneuma, which is breath, the breath of God. He breathed in us the breath of life. The word soul is psyche, where we get psychology. And that's our mind, our will, and our emotions. And we live in a body, in flesh. And it's like any other vote. If two sides on one side, they're going to win. If your soul and your body line up and, you, and you're thinking fleshly thoughts and focused on fleshly things, that's what's going to drive your life. It's going to control your life. But the mind that is set on the things of the spirit, the body is going to go along. All of this is to say we're in a war. I call it an economic war, but it's actually a political war, a cultural war an entertainment war, and a spiritual war. Now I'm going to tell you a group of stories because we have the economic war room. It's a television show on CRTV. CRTV is like the Netflix of conservative thought. It's called Conservative Review Television. It has Michelle Malkin and uh, Mark Levin 
and Steven Crowder and Phil Robertson, the Duck Dynasty guy, and, and Steve Dace. These are all personalities that have their own show on, on and I'm honored to be among them uh, having a show. And it's a show that's been out for about four weeks. So I'm going to tell you stories from the economic war room and how they apply to our life and a different, how we can make a difference. But before I do, I'm going to tell you another story. How many of you have seen the movie Darkest Hour about Winston Churchill or Dunkirk? A good number of you. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend especially Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour Awakes starts with, with Winston Churchill waking up and a secretary coming in to help him and there he's, he's, rumor has it he's going to be named Prime Minister. It's set in May 1940. Rumor has it because Neville Chamberlain has just returned with the peace in our time talk with Hitler and, and quickly after that Hitler's invading Poland and, 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 and you know, completely disregarded the agreement he had with Neville. And so the party is voted no confidence in the prime minister and the only one from their party that will be accepted by the opposition is this Winston Churchill. We don't want him. I can't believe it. He speaks, he, 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 he's crude and he's rude and he's all of these terrible things, but the other side will accept him and, and the people seem to want him, but all right, we'll do it. We'll, we'll put Churchill in. And the king doesn't want this. And it opens up with him learning from the ambassador to France and others that the war's not going well. The British forces, the vaunted world power Britain with the greatest navy in the world and one of the largest armies that has controlled India and has an empire where the sun never sets because there's something British control. You know, Britain has invaded all these countries around the world and was victorious in all of these ways. And they have the bulk of their professional army in France to stop Hitler. 400,000 men and he wakes, he's named prime minister and he goes into his, he immediately creates a war room and a war cabinet. And he goes in and meets with them and they say, 400,000, mostly British, but French and Belgian and Indian soldiers are all on the retreat to the beach town of Dunkirk. That is a beach resort town. This is not a place that you evacuate soldiers from and they're being surrounded by Hitler's panzer divisions. They're just rolling through France. They went straight around the Maginot Line and they just crushed all opposition. It was blitzkrieg and this is going to be the end of Western Europe. And Churchill wakes realizing that he may be prime minister on day one and within a matter of weeks, England may be lost. The German Luftwaffe has built up much more than they ever imagined and they are bombing the harbor, they're bombing the beaches. There is no hope here. And if you see Darkest Hour, you hear Churchill say, you mean we can't even get 25 or 30,000 of our boys home to protect our island nation? And they said, we're able to evacuate 600 men a day max. The British destroyers can't get into the harbor and if they do, they have to ferry them out on, on little boats to get them out. They have one mole that's long enough that they can dock against and the German bombers know it and they keep bombing it. They're sinking destroyers. Everything is lost and they know Western civilization may die here because Nazism is spreading. That's what he woke up to. And the movie shows this, how he gets strength from the British people and how he stands strong and says, no, we will not surrender to Herr Hitler. We will fight. We'll fight them on the beaches. We'll fight them. You've heard the famous speech. We're not going to quit. We're going to fight this. And you see the resolve. And he calls forth the small ships. Essentially, big destroyers can't get into the harbor. But pleasure craft can and sailboats and motor boats. And so he calls for every small ship from Britain, island, island nation from rivers and estuaries and everywhere else to come into Dunkirk to go across 26 miles across the English Channel 
and to get the boys off the beaches and to bring them home. And it's a great victory and it's the huge, greatest evacuation in history. What they don't tell you in that movie or Dunkirk, either movie, they don't tell you the real story, which I'm going to tell you. I told you it's a spiritual war, and it is a spiritual war. And after Churchill was installed as prime minister, King George VI goes out to his people and he calls for a national day of prayer. Everywhere throughout the British Empire, everywhere in London. This is a picture of Westminster Abbey. I don't know if you can see it. You see the lines for miles through London. People lined up to get in there, to get on their knees for a few minutes and just ask the Lord to save their country. And it wasn't just London. It was in India and Australia and Canada and the United States. People said, our culture is being attacked and it will be destroyed unless you, God, intervene. And they cried out in prayer. I imagine a few of them said the prayer from 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And God answered with three distinct miracles. And you don't hear about these in the movies. But there's a brilliant book, A Trumpet Sounds for Britain, written by David Gardner. Bill Federer has written this up. Movie Guide picked up some of this and wrote some of this. And it's also in Reese Howell's Intercessor, where they talk about this. I have a stack in my library of Dunkirk books that would stack this high. I studied this. I wanted to know what happened and how it happened. And here are the three miracles. The first thing is that the Panzer divisions were ready to roll in and they could, in a matter of hours, have killed every British and French soldier. But 10 miles outside Dunkirk, they just stopped. They just stopped. Why? Adolf Hitler gave an order, stop the ground advance. Now, some people think he gave that order because it was marshy around Dunkirk and the panzer tanks would have had a little trouble going through. Others say it's because Hermann Goering said, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, is sufficient. We can bomb the harbor. We can bomb the beaches. We can, we can win this great victory. Whatever reason it was, God saw to it to stop. Now, Goering had a point. He sent a squadron up. And they went to strafe the beaches. There was one beach at Dunkirk where there were 400 British soldiers and they were sitting ducks. Plane coming in, Stuka attacking. They dive into the beach. All 400 men stood up after that and there were bullet holes surrounding where they were. Not one perished. Can you believe that? So David Gardner says, he believes that angels lay on top of them to protect them. God answered prayer. The first miracle was the ground advance stop. The second miracle was almost immediately the clouds over Flanders Field where they'd set the Air Force base up. You know, Flanders Field that we talk about where the dead are buried, that was the Luftwaffe headquarters in France that were assigned to bomb the channel and the harbor. The skies got so tumultuous, they couldn't take planes off. This was, what has happened to the weather? It was nowhere in the weather forecasts. And all of a sudden, boom, God just dropped a storm right on top of them and they couldn't take planes off. And the third miracle was that the English Channel, normally very choppy, got as smooth as glass. And the ships were able to go. The small pleasure craft that would have been torn up in that were able to go the 26 miles and bring the boys home. It's the greatest evacuation in history. 338,000 soldiers were returned back to England to fight that day. I believe in my mind that that was the end of Adolf Hitler, even if it took five years of painful war to nail the coffin and bury it. That's when they lost. That miracle. Now, Churchill said, you'll never You'll never win a war 
by an evacuation. That's not a victory. We avoided a defeat. And Churchill said, on that day, the battle for France is over, the battle for Britain is just beginning. And sure enough, it would. The Luftwaffe would take off again, and they bombed London and the countryside, and they were very active. But that day, I believe the war was won. And it was won by spiritual means, not by soldiers. Now, I share all of that to tell you that the small ships played an important role. They were the heroes of that story. If you're sitting in this room, I'm here also to tell you that you are a small ship. You think, what can I do? The culture has worked, turned against us in all of these areas, in all of these ways. What can I as an individual do to make a difference? And I'm telling you, go get one. Go get one. Go get one. You're the small ships. You're going to make the difference. You're going to change this world. And it's not just you, but it's thousands of you. There was a comment from a pilot that was flying over the channel because the British planes could take off. They didn't have the weather problem that the Germans did in Flanders. The British planes took off. And one of the pilots said, when I flew over the channel, it felt as if one could walk from Dunkirk to Dover, just stepping from ship to ship. There were so many boats there. It felt like that. All of the people individually doing their separate, unique part together saved the men that saved the planet. God arranged that. God did his part. The British Navy did their part. The British Army did their part. But it counted on the small ships. And you are the small ships. We started an economic war room because Winston Churchill needed a war room. And so we actually built our set to look like Winston Churchill's war room bunker, only with high tech. We teched it up. We even have a vault door on the, on the outside. It looks like a war room. Because our job in the economic war room is to equip the small ships, you, with the information you need to go get one, go get one, go get one. President Reagan said, Freedom is only one generation away from extinction. It does not pass in the bloodstream. It's not in your DNA. We have a challenge. It is up to us to take freedom to the next generation. And if we don't, we will spend our sunset years, President Reagan said, telling our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren what it was once like to live in America with freedom. So my job and what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to tell you five stories from the economic war room that you can use and equip you to go out and bring people to the truth so we can win the spiritual war. I'm going to show you this book. The book is titled Unrestricted Warfare. This is a book that is a Chinese language counterpart that is sold by the People's Liberation Army, PLA, of China, their military, in their military bookstores. A friend of mine sent CIA operatives into Beijing to go into a bookstore, buy a copy, bring it out, and the CIA translated it and was published in Panama. And I have this English language copy of it. I also have a copy of the original that they brought out a photocopy that they let me photocopy that I keep in a safe. Why do I do that? Because there are enemies of this nation that are purposely trying to destroy it. Enemies inside and enemies outside. In 1999, two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army said, China has tasked us with determining how to make China the sole superpower of the planet. How do we win this? And America is on top, and there's no way we can militarily combat the United States military. We can't beat their army. We can't beat their navy. We can't beat their air force. They were shocked to see how powerful we were in the Gulf War I, where we wiped out the fourth largest standing army in the, in the world, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi elite Republican guards and army, we wiped them out in a matter of hours. It was watching the clock tick and we shoved them back. And they said the technology the Americans have is far beyond anything. But here's our weakness. 
They said Americans are slaves to technology and their thinking. They think that they can just keep building up missiles and, and uh, planes and dominate the world. They don't understand. They've separated their military from their economics understanding. And so what we'll do is we'll sit at the soft underbelly of America in the economic arena. And the goal is to shake their economic confidence and then the people will turn on them and they'll lose their country. And we'll make it economically beneficial to them to go against traditional American values. So they wrote a game plan and I've just summarized the game plan here. The first thing China must do is muster large amounts of capital. When this was written, the Chinese government had about $100 billion of foreign currency reserves, which sounds like a lot of money, but for a big nation, it's not much at all. Today, they have over $3 trillion. Now, how did they get that? They said, we have to get most favored nation status with America, and we've got to start undercutting their, their markets, and we've got to start shipping goods to them, and we've got to be the supplier for all of these things. And the Clinton administration granted most favored nation status to China. And now if you go home, when you go home, walk in your house and point out to yourself how many products that you have that were made in China, that had been made in America or Europe or Japan just a few years, a couple of decades earlier. Whether it's your clothes or whether it's your TV set or whether whatever it is, China has taken our markets. And we know that. Now, David Ricardo, if you follow free market economics, would say, well, that's fine. David Ricardo, the Ricardian theory of economics, says you let every nation manufacture what they're best at and you do free trade. And I agree with that. I'm a free market economist by training. But what happens if they're not doing it with the purpose of being free trade, but they're doing it with the purpose of undermining you through unrestricted warfare? So the Chinese said, first, let's launch a, a, um, a mass, make, uh, muster a large amount of capital. Second, let's launch a sneak attack against financial markets. Third, we want to bury computer viruses and hacker detachments. Fourth, we want to be prepared to carry out a network attack against the enemy like an EMP, against the electric grid, or like the traffic dispatching network or the ATM network. And ultimately, we want to foster street riots social panic, and a political crisis. And they write how to do it. They know all about how to do it. This was written in 1999, and they were saying, we should learn from a man named George Soros, who knows how to foster these things. We need to support anti-American movements. And by the way, we know that that's happened. We know that it's happened. You've, there was testimony. The Russians bought Facebook ads, and one ad would say, Black Lives Matter, and the other ad would say, support the blue, and they were ginning up controversy on both sides. That's not according to this playbook. This is the war that we're in. And I'm going to give you five stories, but we do a story at least once a week on CRTV where we do a story and we talk about the bad, the problem, the good, the solution, and the beautiful. Our goal is to take people to a higher truth. In my mind, that's taking him to the Lord Jesus. The bad, the good, and the beautiful. It's like Clint Eastwood. He did the good, the bad, and the ugly. We just do it a little opposite. The bad, the good, and the beautiful. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is one we just heard about. Uh, Bill mentioned the Value Voters Summit. At the Value Voters Summit, we had a booth there. I talked to some of the people there. It's my first time to attend. And this nice lady comes up and says, you're the economic warfare guy, aren't you? And I said, yes, I, I am. And she said, I have a form of economic warfare you need to know about. And I said, okay, I'm ready to talk. Now, I'm always cautious because occasionally when I'll speak, one gentleman came up to me and said that, uh, that aliens were radiating his body and that that was a form of economic warfare. And, I need, and so I'm always a little cautious when somebody comes up and said, I said, so what is your form of economic warfare? And she said, did you know that the majority of the drugs, prescription drugs, specifically generics that we produce have a Chinese component and we cannot make them without China's help? No, I did not know that. I checked her out. She's one of the top American medical writers in the world. 
uh, or top uh, medical writers in the world. She has won American Medical Writer Awards. She's a brilliant lady and she's researched this. In the 1990s, before this book was written, 90% of the prescription drugs you take had all their ingredients ma manufactured in the United States, Europe, or Japan. Today, more than half of them have ingredients sourced from China. How did you learn about this? She said, well, a few years ago, there were people having surgery, they go in for surgery and they were dying from complications that seemed unrelated to the surgery and nobody could figure it out. And it was happening here and here and here in such strange locations that we felt there had to be a tainted medicine. And we traced it down and we found it was heparin. You know, the blood thinner? When you're having surgery, they don't want you to clot up, so they give you a blood thinner, right? And heparin is made from pig intestines. And we don't manufacture heparin here anymore. It's manufactured all in China. And somebody enterprising in China realized that we have lots of pigs and there are lots of pig intestines, so they substituted the, the non-medical grade for the medical grade because the non-medical grade is $6 a pound and the medical grade is $600 a pound. And so they said, we can make more money. And so they substituted and 200 and some people died. And she said, that concerned me. And I started to understand and study what you talk about, Kevin, economic warfare and the issues we have with China. And I wondered, could they use this as a weapon against us? You know, they don't just control prescription drugs, but they also control supplements. In fact, if you take vitamin C, ascorbic acid, it's made in China. Odds are strong that all ascorbic acid that we have comes from China because they ran all the makers of vitamin C in the United States out of business. They underpriced them, they formed a cartel, they called it a cartel, and it went to federal court, and the federal court ruled initially well, because we need good relations with China, we'll let them have their drug cartel. Now, it got overturned eventually, but the idea is now there's no American made in vitamin C. It's Chinese made. It's also true for over-the-counter medicines like aspirin. This is a problem. If we get in a war with China, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think they're going to let us continue to get these critical drugs? It's not just that, but when the FDA wants to inspect a plant in the United States, do you think they send them a card and say, in a month from now, we plan to come inspect your plant? Do you think the FDA does that? No. They show up, we're the FDA, show us your stuff. Open the doors, we're inspecting everything. Not in China. In China, if the FDA wants to, they have to get a visa to enter. What do you want your visa for? Well, we're the FDA, we're going to inspect this plant. When are you going to inspect it? So they get weeks of notice. Second thing, the FDA will inspect plants here in the United States every two years. It just happens. How often do you think they go into Chinese plants? Much less frequently. Our drug industry, though, says, I can manufacture much cheaper in China than I can here. And besides, you've got a billion people we could sell drugs to, so we want to sell our drugs there. Oh, well, then you need to manufacture them here. Okay, we'll set up a plant and we'll manufacture that. And you need to do some research and development here. Okay, we'll put research and development. And by the way, when you do this, it's just like with technology and other forms. You give us your intellectual property and show us how it works so we can approve that we like it and we feel good about it. It's called forced technology transfer. And then they hack what they don't get given to them. The net result is they're stealing an entire industry. And when they do that, they're not taking low-wage jobs. In this case, 60,000 chemists lost their jobs to China. These are STEM jobs, the kind that you hear all the time. We're going to graduate STEM graduates, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. These are high-paying, brain-power jobs that we're losing because the Chinese have literally stolen an industry based on this methodology. And they have a big lobby in Washington. 
to protect their industry. The drug industry doesn't want you to know about this. I said, this is a huge story. This book came out in April. I've never heard of this. How come I've never heard of this? Well, there's barely a mention in the media. You look on Amazon for the book, uh, China RX, and it's only a handful of reviews. It's a brilliantly written, scary book with practical solutions. The economic war room was made to get this information out. So I go to the national security community and I tell them a few things. Number one, if there was an anthrax scare, we, could no long, we couldn't dose our troops to protect against anthrax without China's help. Because anthrax, the medicine, the antibiotic, we can't even make penicillin in the United States anymore. And they know something else. They know our FDA laws and how long it takes to get a new plant approved to manufacture drugs. They know that. And not only that, think about this, they actually could have a lobby go into Washington and say, you need to tighten down on those U.S. manufacturer of drugs. They look like they're protecting our citizens, and really what they're doing is they're exporting an industry. It's frightening. If we had no components, drug components from China, all hospitals would be shuttered in two months because we couldn't do surgeries and we couldn't keep patients. We depend that much. And there's no labeling to tell us made in China on your drugs. And that's blood thinners, birth control, generic drugs, critical antibiotics, penicillin, over-the-counter medicines, and supplements. Just about everything we need for our health has a Chinese component to it. So we don't tell you a story of a problem without offering a solution. And so our solution is I've already reached out to my contacts on the National Security Council and we've drafted a presidential order that the president could sign that could save this industry and maybe save our nation. For example, he could sign something that says that in the time, if, if the Congress declares an emergency or the FDA or someone declares an emergency, that U.S. manufacturers can be exempted from all of the protocols for setting up a plant and immediately go into business. We know how to make aspirin, and we can make aspirin. It's just a lengthy period to get something approved to make it and get it out the door because it takes a time period. Presidential order could mandate that we investigate which drugs are critical and that we have a manufacturing capability either currently in the United States or in a friendly country or that we have plans to install one very quickly so that we can ramp up a war effort and protect our nation. And the president can do that by executive order. We even list, if you're a subscriber to CRTV and you watch this episode, at the end of it, we're gonna give you a battle plan. And it's gonna have all the salient facts so you can talk to your congressman or congressional candidates or senators. Imagine showing up at a town hall and your hand goes up and he says, I have a question. And you, the only time politicians really seem to listen to us is when they're running for office. Have you noticed that? But they listen good then. They really do. I get calls from, from uh, Senate candidates from Montana and other places. They call me because I'm on a list. They think I'm a big donor. And they call me and say, Mr. Freeman, I'd like to talk to you. I say, good, I want to talk to you. And I give them the things that I want to see them doing, and they listen. Right now, you have a chance to get people to listen. You get a battle plan. You read the battle plan. It says, what do you do about this? And you say, I want you to do this. And they'll listen. And this isn't a Republican issue, and it's not a Democrat issue. This is a national health issue. This is a national security issue. So we equip you to go and spread this word. You're the small ships. You can carry the message. There's 10 things a nation should do to protect us, and we have them in the battle plan. And by the way, we stick in the battle plan ways you can find out if your drugs are made in China or not, so you can protect yourself. So there's answers for the nation and answers for you individually. That's what we do in the economic war room. That's one story. And I'll tell you a second story, and I'm gonna show you. You all recognize this guy? That's Bill Maher. He's an entertainer. He's a liberal pundit. He has an HBO show. And he is not in favor of the things that most of us in this room, I suspect, believe. 
He has a different vision for America than I do. I want you to listen to what he says because he's commenting on how the economy is going pretty well under President Trump and that bothers him and he has a solution for it. Listen to it. Economy, because this economy is going pretty well. We have to, what? You're, why, why is that funny? Hey, it is going well for now. For now, right. That's my, <laughs> thank you. That's my question. <laughs> is like, the, I feel like the bottom has to fall out at some point. And by the way, I'm hoping for it because I think one way you get rid of Trump is a crashing economy. Yeah. So please bring on the recession. Yeah. Sorry if that hurts people, but it's either root for a recession or you lose your democracy. Who would say that? Sorry if that hurts people. Sorry if people are going to lose their homes. Sorry if people are going to lose their businesses. Sorry if people are going to die. But we got to do this to save our democracy. What's his definition of democracy? Because there's a Democratic elected president sitting in the Oval Office. He was elected under the laws and constitution of this land, duly elected. And you want the economy to crash so you can get him out of there. He has a point. USA Today published a study that I've followed for a long time. Did you know that when the economy crashes, the party in power loses power? That's how it works. Who knows this? George Soros knows it. He's written about it. The economy in power when the market crashes. Think about this. What happened in 1929? Stock market crash. Who was in power? Herbert Hoover and the Republicans. Who gained power in the next election? FDR and the Democrats, and they held power for a long time, four consecutive terms. And the Democrats held Congress for a long time because people remembered the crash and the depression. They blamed the Republicans and they wanted a different way. When else did it happen? It happened in 1973-74. That's with the Nixon impeachment hearings. My father was a stockbroker in 1973. He, he left, he worked for uh, a Skelly Oil Company in 1969 left and went to work for a broker dealer and he was a stockbroker and things went pretty well for a while but in 1973 the Dow was about a thousand and it dropped into the 700s and it was miserable day after day after day the stock market went down it was horrible and what happened what came out of that Jimmy Carter and a move America to the left what happened in 2008? The stock market turned down 10 years ago. Did you know on September 11, 2008, John McCain and Sarah Palin were leading in the polls? They were ahead. They were actually expected. There was a resurgence. The conservative movement was actually energized because we weren't so fond of John McCain, although he's a war hero and we respected that. The conservative movement said, but he picked Sarah Palin and I like her. And all of a sudden, people were motivated and energized, and then the market crashed. The reality of it is the stock market crash portends political change. So could somebody be rooting for a crash? Well, Bill Maher was. Hollywood elites, radical progressives. Why? If you're radically progressive, you want capitalism to fail so you can usher in socialism. Globalist financiers want America taken down a notch or two. You know, our stock market was going strong and China's was weak. We were winning the trade war. They'd like to see America brought down a notch or two. And China, in this book, they say a single man-made stock market crash is a weapon we can use against America. Russia, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Did you know that in 2008, this is our former Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, who presided over the treasury when the market crashed. In the summer of 2008, he visited Beijing for the Summer Olympics. And the Beijing treasury officials met with him and said, Secretary Paulson, Russia came to us and said, we can dump all our holdings of US debt, especially Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and if we do it together, we'll crash America's economy. And it's right before an election and we'll get a more progressive candidate we think. The Chinese said, no, that would hurt us and we're not at the point we're ready to do that yet. Russia went ahead and dumped over $50 billion and may have even been as high as $80 billion with the holdings of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. In the summer of 2008, when the housing bubble was bursting, 
Russia is dumping into our market and trying to cause a panic. They call that a bear raid, meaning a raid to try and start a bear market. That's just a fact. They did that. Fortunately, the Chinese didn't join them. But they did say in this book, Unrestricted Warfare, that we'll reserve the right to cause a stock market crash because that's a way to take a country down. The Russians tried in 2008 and again in 2014, NASDAQ is going through their computer system and they found a digital bomb that was set to explode and they found it to be of Russian origin. So Russia had placed a bomb inside, not physical, but a digital, a computer virus to shut down the markets when they wanted to, on command. Remember what I said? I talked about unrestricted warfare was place a hacker detachment, virus and hacker detachment. Russia did that, and they did it in the NASDAQ. Fortunately, we caught it. Russia has boasted, same year, they boasted. You know, don't put sanctions on us for invading Ukraine because we can crash your economy and crash your stock market anytime we want to. We're fully in charge of the petrodollar and we could cause the Dow Jones Industrial Average to plummet as it's never done before. You can wave the stars and stripes all you want to, but it's a fact that we can turn your economy upside down. That was in Voice of Russia. That was in Pravda. That was all over the Russian media, them boasting that they could control our economy. In 2015, the Justice Department brought charges against a group of spies they called, or a group of individuals they called Russian spies. One of them was a banker, and we intercepted conversation between him and his handlers in Russian translated, which basically said, go and find out how to use exchange-traded funds to cause destabilization of American financial markets. Learn how to do that. This is serious. This is causing a single man-made stock market crash. It's a new concept weapon. So in the economic war room, we talk about the risks of the market turning down. And we just filmed a show on it, and, but we didn't give you just the problem. We brought in two experts, John Malden and David Tice. They're friends of mine from the financial realm. If you were a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, you would know these guys intimately. John Malden has a conference every year where the who's who of Wall Street attends to listen to what he and all the other people that he brings in have to say. David Tice ran the Prudent Bear Fund, which was one of the most successful funds at protecting wealth during bear markets. And so we brought them in, and here's what we talked about. Bear markets follow bull markets. Right now, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. We're worried about valuations. Does this mean the market's going down? Well, John Templeton said in 47 years, he's never met anybody who could predict. And I've lived since then another 31 years, and I've never met anybody who could predict with precision where the market's at. I don't know, and nobody I know knows. But there will be a bear market coming, and we are a little bit worried about these midterm elections. Why? Well, I wrote a piece called The October Surprise. What if somebody's messing with our market to change the election? That's a thought. But even if that's not the case, maybe the stock market's just looking at this crop of candidates and saying, wow, they're pro-socialism, they're pro-impeachment, they're wanting to roll back the tax cuts, and..." Roll back deregulation, that'd make me nervous. As it does, but it'd make the stock market nervous. Because what's caused the market run up? Well, tax cuts and deregulation have been a big part of improved corporate profits. What if that all gets taken away? What if socialism and we have guaranteed incomes that socialism talks about, like this Alexandra Ocasio Cortez? There's a vowed socialist. Bernie Sanders almost got the nomination for the Democratic Party. What if we have impeachment hearings 24-7 on the cable news? Do you think the markets will respond well to that? The Democrats control the House. That's what we get having come up. So we don't just tell you the problem. We tell you about solutions. How do you spot a peak? What are the chances of a melt-up versus a melt-down? Are there ways to protect your portfolio? And they get into some complex things that I can't really talk about uh, here, 
but they talk about just ways you can protect your portfolio. So we give you in the economic war room the bad, the good, and then we try and take you to the beautiful. And we give you things that you can take. So you carry on a conversation. Hey, I want to talk about this candidate versus this candidate. They may want to talk to you about personality. Aren't they nice? Aren't they great? Oh, they're not associated with the rest of the Democrats or the rest of the Republicans. We're going to separate and just say, well, we're just voting for an individual. No, you're not. When you vote for a congressperson or a senator, you're going to help determine the majority that's in there. And the majority is in there. You're going to find the leadership. And so you might vote for the nicest Democrat you know that's going to run and he's, he's a great family person or she's a great family person and all these good things. But that means Nancy Pelosi is the speaker. And that means Maxine Waters runs the Financial Services Committee. That means Chuck Schumer runs the Senate. And they're going to run impeachment hearings, even if you have a really nice congressman. And the same thing on the Republican side. You vote for the, you might really like your Republican and say, great, well, then the Republican leadership is going to be in charge. Well, that's what you get. It's not voting for the individual, it's voting. It's a national election. All right, so that's the second story, threat to the stock market. I'm going to tell you a third story. Did, what do you think the greatest national security crisis we face, according to uh, our director of national intelligence? What do you think that is? And is, it, is it because of the new sonic bombers? Is it because of stealth fighters? Is it because, yes, the grid is a great one. That's a great one. And I, I would have to say that that is a massive national. But in terms of most likely things that we're going to face that are going to happen, According to DNI Coates, our national debt is the greatest national. And this isn't a partisan issue. It was said under the previous administration, too, our national debt is the greatest national security threat that we face. Why? Because it's out of control. We owed 800 and some billion dollars when President Reagan took office. Uh, when in 1990 it was $3 trillion. in 2000 it was $5.7 trillion. When President Obama took office, it was just under $10 trillion. And when he left office, it was $20 trillion. And in the last year and a month, last year, one month and two weeks, it's gone up $1.5 trillion. Why is this the greatest national security threat? Well, for one reason, it's unsustainable according to the Nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Here's why it's unsustainable. How many people in here realize that our government was paying 2% or less on, on borrowed money just a year or two ago? 2% or less. But in your lifetime, how many people here remember that one, at, there was a time we paid 10% or more? Do you remember 10% or more? Okay, so let's say the fair market range for our debt is between 2 and 10%. If you average it out, it's 6%, right? That's an, that would be average, 2 to 10%. And we're seeing the Federal Reserve raising interest rates regularly. That not under Obama, by the way. There was not one single interest rate increase during the entire eight years of the Obama administration. But the Trump administration has seen multiple regular ongoing interest rate increases. He's not happy about it either. And, if you look at your Twitter account, you can see that. You know, the president's not afraid to tell you what he thinks on Twitter. Have you noticed that? So 6% interest on $21 trillion is $1.2 trillion a year. $1.2 trillion a year. Our entire federal government tax system brings in a little over $3 trillion a year. And we spend about $4 trillion a year. And that's when interest rates were low. If interest rates go up, we're going to be spending another trillion or more. So we might be spending five trillion and bringing in three trillion, which means we're adding two trillion to the debt every year. And the more we add to the debt, the riskier we become as a borrower, and the interest rate continues to go higher. And this is how Venezuela collapsed, and Zimbabwe, and Weimar Germany. They spent more money than they brought in, they had to print it. There's three, th three ways you can fund a massive deficit. So if you individually are spending $40,000 a year and your income's 30,000 after taxes, 
you, you, you've got $10,000. How, how are you going to fund that? Well, you can fund it by borrowing more, right? Federal government has an advantage. They can do one of three things. They can borrow more internationally and go to other nations and say, would you like to buy our bonds? And China is the largest holder of those bonds. They can borrow it internally. They can come to you and say, buy U.S. bonds. And in fact, a few years ago, they floated the idea that if you have an IRA or a pension plan, they're just going to mandate that you invest in the U.S. Treasury and suppose stock market's too risky. Don't put it in the stock market. You have to put it in the Treasury. And they'll guarantee you. Or the third way they can do it is they can go to the Federal Reserve and say, you buy our bonds and print money to do it. It's called monetizing the debt. Well, our foreign nations are less and less interested in buying our bonds because unrestricted warfare says don't let the U.S. have the reserve currency of the world, so stop buying U.S. Treasury bonds. And we've seen a decrease. The American people don't want to buy bonds because if interest rates are going up, if you buy a bond when rates are 2%, it pays you 2%, it's not worth as much as a bond, a new bond that pays 4%. So that means the value of that bond goes down and bond prices go down. So you say, I bought bonds, interest rates went up and I lost money. So that leaves the Federal Reserve, which is now saying, we don't want to print so much money. We're going to raise interest rates and we're going to stop monetizing the debt. The net result of it is you have a crisis. So the state of Utah hired me to do a fiscal risk analysis. And they did this. Uh, in 2015, and I completed the project in January of 2016. Why? Do you remember when we had a government shutdown a few years ago? Government shutdown? My senator was reading green, green eggs and ham from, just to keep the filibuster going so the government shut down. We shut down the government, and the government did what? They closed every national park. They closed every anything that could impact people because they wanted us to feel it. Well, 80% of the state of Utah is owned by the federal government. And all those beautiful ski resorts and all those beautiful places that they have, national parks, all got shut down. And their economy collapsed because they had no tourists coming in because you couldn't go skiing. Now, you might ask yourself, why would the federal government can close down national parks that were making money net? They wanted us to feel that pain. Utah says we are far too dependent on the federal government. They come in and they tax our citizens. They take the tax out and then they give it back to us and they control it. I don't like that. We have no control over what they tax and we have no control over when they spend. I don't like that. We need to understand what the federal government has in control of our future. So I did a very lengthy report that described the budget and where things were going. And I said, we're on path, there are only four possible outcomes. We can have a fiscal financial crisis. That's what Venezuela is going through right now. There are people eating out of trash cans. I don't want that. Do you want that? I don't want that. That's a bad outcome. I don't want that one. But that's where we're headed. We can have a rapid reduction in spending. Now, I'm not too opposed to that one. That one's not too bad, although it would have massive economic implications. But the only way to solve this is we either have to stop spending, which is what you would do as a family. You're bringing in $40,000 a year or you're bringing in $30,000 a year and you're spending $40,000. What's the answer? Cut your spending. President Trump went to his cabinet the other day and he said, all of you cabinet secretaries, your budget, I want you to cut by 5%. And they screamed, not the secretaries, but Washington screamed, you can't do that. That's what a business person does. That's what a family does. We're spending too much, cut back. They said, that's not how government works, Mr. President. We can't do that. We'll see if the businessman wins or the politicians win. And we'll see in the midterm election, by the way. So we could cut our spending, and that would be a good outcome. Or we could massively increase our taxes. And what we're talking about is massive. We're talking about top tax rates in the 50, 60, 70% range, which, by the way, is where they've been in the past. Or we can change the circumstances sufficiently. How do you do that? When President Trump took office, we had not had a year that really exceeded 2% annual growth. 
It was the weakest recovery since a recession in history. 1.9% average annual growth or something like that during the Obama term. And they said, this is as good as it gets. Don't let that charlatan snake oil salesman Trump fool you. We'll never grow faster than that again. That's just the reality of the modern economy. And Donald Trump said, I don't think so. And we started deregulating. You know, for every new regulation we put in in the Trump administration, 12 have been removed. And he cut taxes and he cut corporate taxes and we're seeing an economic boom. And that's what Bill Maher said, I wish this boom would stop. So we could substantially increase taxes. I'm gonna give, go one, one, I know it's 10, 15. Bill, where are you? Can I give one other story? Okay, I was in London in 1985, visiting London. My father had an investment conference and we had the privilege of going to eat at Brockett Hall. Brockett Hall, some say, is where Winston Churchill was when he got word he was prime minister, that he was staying there. And Lord and Lady Brockett sat down with us to eat, and it was, a, it was an amazing thing. And because my daddy was in charge of the conference, I got to sit at the head table with Lord and Lady Brockett, and I'm just awed. They have Rolls Royces and helicopter pads and artwork on the walls. These guys must be bazillionaires. They're so rich. Wow! And I started thinking about how wealthy they are, and I'm just starry-eyed, and I look and I look at Lord Block, Brockett, and I said, wait a minute. How come you have a hundred people in your house for dinner tonight? You're rich. Why would you do that? And, and you know, blurting out, just out of college. I was like, well, dude, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be bringing all these strangers in my house. I'm rich. Why would why do you do that? And he says, I need the money. No, 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 that doesn't make sense. You, don't you own all this? He says, yeah, I own all that. But I have to pay insurance on all of it. I was like, dude, sell one of those Rolls Royces out in the front. You get 100 grand for that easy. And you, could, you, you wouldn't have to open your home for dinner and go schlepping and doing all this. He said, no, no, I, it, it would be too expensive. This is not making any sense to me at all. What do you mean it would be too expensive? He said, okay, what would you have me do? I said, sell it, buy a CD. Right now, you're getting 10% interest. Sell it, $100,000, you get $10,000 a year just off selling that one Rolls Royce and you get that $10,000 a year. And he said, son, do you realize that the t uh, marginal tax rate, top tax rate in Britain is 97%? What does that mean? That means that I get that $10,000, $9,700 would go to the British government and I'd keep $300. Would you rather have $300 or own a Rolls Royce? I think I'd like the Rolls Royce. If I gave you $300, would you give me the Rolls Royce? <laughs> he said, no, it's the, it's the confiscatory tax rates. I said, man, why don't you sell it and put all this money into building a business or something? He said, it makes no sense. So the British people out that were supposed to be helped by the 97% tax rate so they could take from the rich and give to the poor weren't getting any of it because it was sitting in a Rolls Royce and artwork and a big mansion. It was sitting there locked up because that's what happens when you have socialism. People hoard their wealth. They lock it up. They never invest it. They never spend it. Maggie Thatcher came along, lowered the tax rate, and the British economy took off, just like it did here in America. So I don't like substantial increase in taxation. I don't think that would do the trick. It might do the trick short term, but in the long term, we'd be a moribund socialist economy with wealth transfers and everybody be hoarding. And they'd be cheating, just like they did in Greece. They were cheating. We have to change the circumstances. The way to change the circumstances is to get the country growing. If you have 4% growth, you have a different outcome on all of the projections than 2%, massively different. Really, all you have to do is cap spending and grow the economy, and it solves the problem. You know when we tried that? We tried that when Newt Gingrich came into Congress in the midterm elections in 1994 with a contract with America, and we put in that we weren't going to increase spending, and the economy grew, blew past it, and we had the only Bill Clinton will still talk about this today. The only surplus was under President Bill Clinton, and it was because the Republican Congress refused 
to increase spending. And the economy grew, we had a boom, and we ran a small surplus, and we solved the problem until we started spending again. The war on terror and all the other things that we've gone through. We have to change the circumstances. So we don't just have a problem, national debt, we have a solution. And we have a practical solution and ways that you go out and tell a story like the Brockett Hall story. And young people will get it because I got it. It woke my eyes up to the dangers of socialism. It sounded good to have the Lord and Lady Brockett. We'll take 97% of what they earn away and we'll give it to the poor. But the poor were getting nothing because they locked up all their wealth. And they kept their income down at very low levels so they didn't have to pay the tax just enough to keep up the insurance and the upkeep on their property. All right, so the next story. This is a good news story. This is one that's already working in our favor, but it's under threat. It's the American energy revolution. And rather than tell you this story, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna show you just a clip from my TV show. This is just a very short clip. It's something that you can share on Facebook. If you don't wanna write notes and send this to people to help them understand how important this story is, if you're on Facebook, you can just click share and send it out. Our job, my job, is to equip you to help pass on the greatness of America to the next generation because you're the small ship. So watch this. In, in 2008, at one point, the uh, price per barrel of oil hit $147.50 per barrel. Yes. If you took out the U.S. shale revolution, what would have happened to the price of oil? If you didn't have the U.S. shale revolution, you could easily have $200 a barrel oil. If you think about it, Granted, what happened in 2008, some people would argue, uh, was engineered by the Saudis. They were taking advantage of a situation. They could jack up the price. There was nothing we could do. Um, well, I saw it in the U.S. futures market. I saw it uh, that um, uh, Qatar and uh, UAE and others were manipulating and playing in the futures market, but it was somewhat engineered. There were, price, there were supply constraints, and there were a whole lot of unique things going on as we're hitting recession. But the price hit 147.50. You're saying today it could be $200 a barrel if we didn't have the shale revolution, and that would be a real price, not an engineered price. Yes, because not only uh, back in those days, you go back to 2008. Since that time, world population has continued to grow. Uh, world demand for oil has continued to grow. Whatever you might be told, people who are already alive in China and India, they want a more uh, modernized and motorized life and that means more and more oil so it was clear in 2008 that another Saudi Arabia or Russia was going to have to come online to meet that demand to keep the prices from skyrocketing if, and that's exactly what happened the US came online if at that we level. had $200 a barrel oil unemployment would be much greater than it is tax revenues would be much lower people's budgets would be busted the economy would be growing much more slowly it it, it would have potentially thrown us into a depression oh yeah if not a great depression uh, and and what this saying is the heroes economically are the American shale revolution it's the American frackers who really are the heroes here and I mean, there. by the way, there are thousands and thousands of them. These are not a handful of rich guys like the press would have you believe. There are thousands of energy companies. 95% of our production in this country is, is not by the super majors. We're not talking about Exxon and Chevron and Shell and BP. We're talking about mom and pop companies all over the land. And millions of us own that oil and gas. If you're a landowner, if you hold a pension, uh, a 401k, um, an IRA, chances are extremely high you're invested in industries that rely on oil and gas. It's an entrepreneurial revolution. It is, if you saw the movie Dunkirk, you know the, the small ships that helped rescue the soldiers mm -hmm. off the beaches. Uh, these are the small ships of America that are helping win the economic war for us. This is one of the most important stories in the economic wars. All these individual entrepreneurs that are putting their lives and money at risk and they've gone and they've created this revolution and it's changed the planet. Tell yes. us a little more about it. So this century, at least the first half of it, will be the American century. They try to say it's the Chinese century, it is not. 
the whole geopolitical map has changed. And most P Americans don't even know this. They still think we're relying on OPEC, the cartel that controls 71% of reserves. Um, we now, for the first time in my lifetime, do not have to worry um, that every time a foreign dictator wants to spin up or, or start a war or a civil war, that the price of oil will spike, which impacts everything in our lives. It's not just gasoline. Um, everything in this studio pretty much is made of oil or petrochemicals. Your pharmaceuticals are, your plastics, your vinyls. Um, obviously, you have to heat your home. That's natural gas. Electricity. Gasoline. Electricity. Um, but the shale revolution is also not just oil. It's revolutionized natural gas. Yes. And natural gas is like... We're swimming in it now, right? We're on an ocean of natural gas. We're drowning in it. It was always there. We just didn't know how to get it out economically, extract it in a way that was, you know, made sense, that where the cost wasn't outweighing the, the benefit to the producer. So that's how we are now. Um, by the way, I'm told by the frackers, the most successful frackers in Texas, we're only getting between 7 and 15 percent of the oil and natural gas in that shale rock. So what, remaining behind is a monstrous supply of oil and gas, and they're telling me, you know, give us time. Technology Every year we get better. Producing. Yes. They said we're going to get 100 percent. Every year they get better and better and better. You know, I, I could go into detail about precisely how you stack fracks. Now they're lateral, they're horizontal in every direction going out from the well. It's changing the world. I don't see us running out of oil, certainly not in our lifetime, which is what people predicted, right. you'll remember. Right. And um, this is well, American. Peak oil was supposed to be mid-1970s. Yeah, it's right? over, right? Peak oil, in other words, we wouldn't have enough to meet world demand, and world population does continue to grow. So that's a good news story. Who, who would be against that? Who would have a problem? Pardon me? Environmentalists, but who else? Who doesn't want America producing oil? Could it be Saudi Arabia? Could it be Russia, largest producers? Okay, so environmentalists under the Obama administration figured out something. They could go to a friendly EPA and they could say, hey, you're messing with the environment and we want you to stop. And the EPA could prearrange an agreement that they would take to a federal court it's called sue and settle, and they'd say, okay, we agree, we won't do this. So they'd tell the environmental group, hey, tell us that you want this. Now, if the EPA came out and said, we're changing the clean air rules and mandating that you don't do this, there'd be an uproar and Congress would get involved. But if an environmental company, an environmental group sued the EPA and it went to federal court and they agreed to it, that becomes settled law and Congress doesn't even get involved. The votes of the people don't matter. It's called Sue and Settle. There was an effort not long ago, 2011, to get a two-inch desert lizard called the sagebrush lizard or the sand dune lizard that is prevalent in West Texas, declared an endangered species, which would have virtually shut down all of the Permian Basin of West Texas. Now, the United States is now the number one producer of oil and gas, or very close to it, and it just kind of jockeys between Saudis, Russia, and America right now. But, but we've recently been number one in both oil and natural gas in production. On a standalone basis, West Texas Permian Basin is number three in the world by itself. That's how important it is. You shut that down, and we are not an energy powerhouse. We're back to importing massive amounts of oil and funding both sides of the war on terror. We were within a pen stroke of declaring that an endangered species and ending this. Now, who would want to do that? Well, Russia and Saudi Arabia, for one, and radical leftists, environmentalists. Well, guess what? When we found collusion between Russia and the political process of the United States, and we found it without question, we found it in Russia funding environmental groups to stop fracking. And it's not just us. The head of NATO admitted publicly that Russia has been funding 
anti-fracking, anti-shale development efforts around the world because they have traditional oil that they want to sell into the markets. This is an economic war. This is whether or not Russia is the dominant player on the planet or the United States is. This is between Saudi Arabia and the United States. This is a war. And I could go into much more detail on that because I studied it, but there are things you can do to get this word out. And there are things you can do to help protect American energy security. That's the fourth. I'm going to give you the fifth story, which is the threat of socialism. And to do that, I'm going to show you another clip, but instead of, uh, of just hearing me on this, I want you to hear it, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, who came into the economic war. And we have the best and the brightest minds in the country. I have friends with all these wonderful people, and they come into the war room and they share their insights, and then we share them with you. So listen to what Colonel West has to say about socialism. Wealth redistribution is not consistent with our Constitution. Nationalizing economic production is not consistent with our Constitution. Creating and expanding a welfare state is not consistent with our Constitution. Social egalitarianism is not consistent with our Constitution. And it's not consistent with success. It's definitely not Where consistent. in the world has Nowhere. socialism worked? Nowhere. Nowhere. But, but this is the interesting argument. Whenever you talk to them, well, they didn't understand pure socialism. Well, I mean, help me out here. You know, all of you guys were running down there to Venezuela and you were, you know, slapping high fives or Hugo Chavez talking about how great he is. Funny you don't see him going down to Venezuela now that they're eating out of garbage yeah. cans. So where has it worked? Name, it has name not. A, where, okay, so what, what, about East, what about Europe? No, well, you know what? It's interesting that you're starting to see many of these countries in Europe moving away from it. Look at the, uh, the new, uh, I guess, president, prime minister of, of Italy. They're moving away from this. And I always like it how, you know, the, the progressive socialist left here in the United States of America says that we need to be more like some of the Scandinavian countries. Well, those Scandinavian countries are moving away from it too. But how can you compare the United States of America, 350 million people, to a country of 3.5 million people? I, I mean, some of these countries that they think uh, we should emulate, they're not even the size of Dallas-Fort Worth. Mm. And so, no, this, this is not a successful platform. And as countries, what's their defense budget like? What do they spend for the common defense, well, which is a legitimate role of government? It, it, is, it is the legitimate role of government. And if you read Frederick Bastiat's The Law, I mean, that's what you know, the government is supposed to do, protect its citizens and not come up with this misconceived philanthropy and this naked greed, which is what you have. Uh, I was stationed over in Europe. That was my first duty assignment. The United States of America provided the security blanket for those European countries. And so those European countries were able to go off on all these social welfare junkets. And I think that's to the credit of President Trump now to come up and say, hey, you know, McFly, yeah. time to pay up. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're not sacrificing, we're not doing this anymore. And, and when he brought up the fact that, you know, Angela Merkel in Germany is sitting down and they're making a deal with Russia to have an oil and gas pipeline, well, how is it that you are telling us, and the United States is really NATO, how is it that you're telling us to be over here to protect you from this bad guy, but you're doing business with this bad guy? Yeah. Why aren't you buying the oil and gas from us? Oh, and oh, by the way, when are you going to pay up that 2% of your GDP for, for NATO defense? But the people that are getting it are the folks in Eastern Europe. Poland gets it. The Baltic states, because they Because they it. came out of the They oppression. came out of it, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. so I think when you talk about where we're looking at economically in, in Europe, I think that you may be seeing a shift from the old Europe, Western Europe, over to Eastern Europe. You know, better security arrangements, better uh, national security uh, deals and military exercises, and better economic trade arrangements as well. Okay, so how do you get a beautiful out of that? Let me tell you the beautiful. A friend of mine is a lady named Virginia Prodan. And Virginia was, um, was in our studios recently. She has an amazing story about when she was in Romania and she was a lawyer and she was trying to defend Christians as a lawyer. And the government decided they'd had enough of her. So they sent in a man to kill her. And he had permission from the government and he was there to kill her and uh, walked through the door. Are you Virginia Prudent? I am. I am from the, com from the communist government here and, and I'm here to kill you. 
And you know what she said? She said, that's okay. I know Jesus. I'm going to heaven. What? <laughs> no, it's okay. You need to do this. But before you do, can I talk to you? Okay. Your last words, go ahead. I said, I just want to ask if you know Jesus. She literally saved her assassin. The title of her book is Saving My Assassin. She's alive today, and the man came to Christ and, and left. He, he didn't know how to deal with her except accepting Jesus. That's a true small ship. And by the way, she is. She's a little beautiful little short lady and, and um, dear friend of the family. She's a small ship that she's making a difference in the earth. So when we talk about socialism and, and, and so forth, we got to realize we have a permanent home in heaven. Yeah. And, but we don't want people to be hurt by this. It's a terrible system. And yet it's taking over one of the great political parties. This is not your grandfather's Democratic Party. Right. It's very, very different. And that may be the nicest person in the world that you're talking to that's running for office. But if they've got the D behind your name, what it comes with it is the leadership. So with every show, we put together a battle plan. And the battle plan is a PDF document that you can print and read that's got shareable facts, it's got interesting information, it's got talking points, and it's got practical things you as an individual can do and we as a nation should do. Every show has a battle plan. And what, what I'm going to give you as my battle plan for this talk is I want you to become an economic patriot. How can you be an economic patriot? Well, first, the most important thing to become an economic patriot is to not put your treasure here on earth. Because if you're worried, if that's your treasure and your treasure is here on earth, there's no way you're going to be able to do what I'm going to suggest that you do because you'll be all worried about protecting your money. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. And if he were, were here right now speaking to you, you might say, and hackers can hack. Don't put your treasure there. Your money may be there, but it shouldn't be your treasure. Put your treasure in heaven. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If the stock market crashes and you lose all your financial wealth, be like Virginia and know that you still have a home in heaven. And it's better than here, I promise. But to be an economic patriot means that you need to mobilize your money. Actually, I'm going to take it a step further. I want you to weaponize your money. Who among you here drank coffee this morning? Good number of you. How is it and why is it that you'll walk into a church and they have coffee and it says, proudly serving Starbucks? We don't want to buy Arab oil because that was funding both sides of the war on terror. We don't want to put money in the collection plate and buy Starbucks because we're funding both sides in the war on culture. Do you hear what I'm saying? And it goes the same with our investments too. You know, you'll invest in something. It's a great company. I want to own a piece of it. It's doing great things economically, but they're funding terrible things philosophically. So that's why my friend and the, that introduced us to me to Bill uh, was Art Alley, and actually it's the reverse. Bill introduced me to Art, and I didn't know it. He gave my book to, he'd heard me on Frank Gaffney and other programs, so he gave my book to Art, and Art called me in, and, and, and I spoke to the Timothy plan, which is a way that you can invest where your investments are screened based on biblical values. You're weaponizing your money. And the same thing can be said with your spending. So I met recently a man who started a cell phone company called Patriot Mobile. And I'm not advertising for them. I have no idea if that's good for you. I'm not recommending the investments. I'm making you aware that when you have AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile or Sprint, that you have companies that probably donate to things that you don't believe in. Patriot Mobile has decided they're going to donate to things that they believe in, and they tend to line up with a lot of the people I know. And so when I met with the founder and the CEO of Patriot Mobile, I said, hey, that's a way to weaponize your money. That's how you spend your money. If your treasure is here on earth, it's kind of hard to do that. 
it's kind of hard to, 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 because you're making decisions that are all about protecting your treasure. But if your treasure's in heaven, your money is a tool, it's a weapon, something you can use to help us win the culture wars. And then you won't fear that moths and rust destroy or thieves break in and steal. Now, Proverbs 27, 12, and I think it's also Proverbs 22, 7, I think. But it's two Proverbs. If you read a proverb a day, you'll see it. And, and this one stands out to me. A wise man sees danger coming and prepares for it. But a fool goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. I'm telling you there's danger coming. The whole point of the economic war room is to tell you about the dangers coming. Not to get you fearful, but so that you can prepare and respond. So, we need to use unrighteous mammon to further the things that we truly treasure. You remember there's the wise steward, the one that was getting fired, the shrewd one. He's getting fired and he went out and he used his master's money and he tore up bills so he made friends. You remember that? Jesus told that parable. He said, yeah, there was a, there was a shrewd man. The master says, I'm going to fire you. But before he got fired, he went out to all the people that owed the master money and he tore up their bills and cut them for half. All right, tear that one up and we'll put half in. And he made him, and he said, what a shrewd, what a shrewd servant he was. He used unrighteous mammon to make friends. Well, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And what he's saying in the spiritual analogy is, hey, it's easy. Go forgive other people of sins to bring them to the kingdom. But it can be applied here. Use the money you've got. It's, you're not taking it with you. It's absolutely going to get burned up and useless. So let's use it to further the kingdom of God. And you can use that by giving. You can use it by investing. And you can use it by spending. It's a tool. It's not an end in itself. And so that's the message of the economic war room. So if you're interested and you want to get this kind of information ongoing, you can get it at your leisure. It's like a Netflix or Pure Flix for those of you who do that or probably have family members who do that. And they pay $10 a month and they get access to all these movies. Which, by the way, a huge portion of those movies, I'm sad to report, are promoting things that you don't agree with. And there's entertainment seeding into the culture. So there's an alternative called Pure Flix. But you pay $10 a month and you can watch at your leisure. Whenever you'd like, you can watch movies on these subjects. Or you can binge watch and watch this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. CRTV is conservative review television and you've got these great luminaries and they have everything they've ever produced in one spot and you can go back and watch it and you get equipped to go share the message. And our part of that is Economic War Room where we equip people on the kind of things we've talked about here and there's a new show every week and you get a battle plan that you walk out. It costs you $10 a month but I'd like you to try it and you can try it for free. There's cards out on the table. Take that, go to economicwarroom.com and go through that link and you get one month free which will give you eight episodes, the four we've already shot and the four we're going to shoot that we'll release over the next four weeks. And you watch any of those eight. And you can download the battle plans for free. And if you like it, you can subscribe for a year. I think the current discount offer using our promo code is $89. And by the way, that's the only way we make money off this is, is that when people subscribe using our promo code. That's, that's how I get paid. But I don't care. Take the freebie. And if you have to take another freebie or get, get everybody you know to take a freebie, we've got to spread this word. And then the last thing that we need to do, and it may be the most important thing that we do, I told you about the miracle of Dunkirk and how the small ships did the difference. They prayed, then they did the work. But the third thing, this slide is different from the previous one because I put give thanks. After the 338,000 soldiers were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk and returned to England, and the trains were taking them back to their bases and their homes, King George called for another day, a national day of thanksgiving. And even though Winston Churchill said the war for the Battle of France is over, the Battle for Britain is just beginning, and they had precious little time to prepare before the Luftwaffe bombers came over London, 
Even before that, King George said, no work today. By royal decree, we are all going to get on our faces before God Almighty and give Him thanks for saving our troops. If you learn nothing else from this, from everything I've shared, learn those are the three steps of success. We have to pray about it. We have to do our part and work. And then we have to give thanks to God no matter what happens. Because he's sovereign. And that is the bad. We're praying about the bad. We're working. That's the good. And the beautiful is to give God the glory he deserves no matter what. And with that, I say God bless you and thank you for the opportunity.